Have you ever wondered what one of the key ingredients to make money was for professional traders? Professional traders who make their living from their trading PL. In this video, we reveal that key ingredient. I'm Mike Bellafuri, and we're one of the top proprietary trading firms located in New York City and proud to have developed numerous seven and even eight figure per year traders. We hope you agree. This is the top YouTube channel to help you grow your trading account. Okay, I'm here with an SMB trainee and we're gonna judge one of his playbook trades. We're gonna score him on 10 criteria and give him a score to see if he's meeting the standards expected by us. His playbook is titled Fresh News Drive Through Pre Market Level, and we're gonna break his trade down. Pay special attention to the key ingredient he's missing from his trading strategy to make money. I hope this gives you a clear example of how a professional trader must think through a trade and what's necessary for you to make a professional and profitable trade. Okay, let's meet SMB trainee Grant. See if he passes his test in the hot seat. He's going to need a score of 80 or better. And we'll get into his opening drive momentum trade. This is a money making strategy, a money making trading strategy used by top traders, though Grant will have to add one key ingredient to his trade, which we're going to teach. All right, Grant, okay. welcome. Appreciate you spending some time with us. Uh, Give us a little bit of a background as to who you are and how you got here. Sure. Yeah. Um, so my name's Grant. I um, I got here through the tier system. So um, basically, I had talked through. I had talked with Jeff a few years back, uh, more than f probably three, about three years, um, about the possibility of coming in for an internship. I had some things come up, and uh, it just didn't work out. So. I basically went back to the drawing board and um, started doing some work on my own, um, watching all of the videos you guys put out and, and studying um, as much as I could of the free content and um, started putting things together on my own. And then uh, once I could get into the tier system, I, I got in that way and have just worked my way through up to tier three and now uh, now doing, doing work with some of the guys at the firm and uh, communicating and connecting with them and, and now doing a playbook with you. So um, that's kind of a, a short overview of, of how, how we've gotten here. I don't know that everybody knows what the tier system is for the SMB training students. Can you can you give us a little bit of uh, explanation as to what, what that is? Sure, yeah. Um, so the tier system is, is basically you, you buy uh, the education courses uh, that SMB offers and that all of the interns go through so the DNA course and um, the winning trader and um, so you basically start in tier one and and that's basically your intro level you're learning all of the setups and um, the types of trades that the firm makes and, and who the traders are and, and kind of their styles and things like that and after you complete tier one um, you basically get bumped to tier two after you finish the courses and in tier two that's where uh, you really start focusing in on doing your own DRCs, um, daily playbooks, and uh, you basically have a, um, a Discord channel where you keep note and, and keep um, document all of the work you're doing. And after a certain period of time, you are able to submit your work to Jeff, and Jeff will either approve or um, basically tell you to keep working. Uh, but if, if he approves your work, uh, you get bumped up to tier three, which is where you can uh, hop in the Discord each morning. You can um, share playbooks, do reading the tape, which I've done with Jeff a, a couple of times. So you get access to um, basically, you're basically an intern. Uh, you get all of the access that an intern would in office. Uh, you just had to work your way up a different kind of way. So when you say, Grant, that you're getting access to the Discord, you mean the SMB intern Discord channel. Yes, yeah, exactly. All right, so Jeff, myself, the interns, you're getting access to that. Yep, yep. exactly. Right. And then you get access to the mentoring sessions that we provide to our interns as well? Yes, yep, we can sit in on those and share our own ideas and um, take, yeah. It's, it's really a, um, 
it's a nice I think I've heard you call it in the past uh, the back door and it's it's it really is it's a nice back door it, it gives um, it gives people the opportunity that if if they're doing good work I think it gives gives it gives you a chance to uh, connect with other traders that are willing to do the same kind of work and I've uh, I've really enjoyed just the couple of months I've been here in tier three so yeah so if you, if you are if you take SMB DNA and you take uh, SMB the winning trader and then you're doing really good work you give yourself a chance to get recognized by the firm you're doing good playbook trades you're calling out good ideas and if you if you're doing that it gives students this opportunity to be recognized for working hard and being diligent and being serious and then if you get recognized by the firm, you get to join all the stuff that the interns are, are doing here. Interns are U.S. college students who we're taking a look at, and they're trying to get hired by the firm. So they've applied. They've been selected amongst all the people that have applied from U.S. colleges. They're with us here in New York City in-house going through uh, our internship program, hoping to get hired. Yeah, but, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really great way to give serious SMB students a way to catch our attention. And I suppose what, what they really want is to get hired by the firm. But from the firm's perspective, we want to know that you're serious. We want to know that you do good work. We want to know that you actually learned a lot during SMB DNA and the winning trader. We want to know that you collaborate well with others, that you have good ideas, that your tape reading skills are getting better, that you're doing good playbooks. The things that we think go into building a good, consistent trader, you're showing us that you can do some of that stuff. So, all right, good. I'm glad we put that program together. So because of that, you are here today. I know we canceled a couple of times in the past. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, we... Um, I, I am I admittedly on a summer schedule, tell by my tan. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I have a very active family life. And, and unfortunately, uh, my wife and my kids change my daily plans from minute to minute. And so sometimes I make commitments that have to get amended. But we're here now and uh, looking forward to seeing this. I'm hearing really good things about you and looking forward to seeing the, the work you're doing here. Awesome. Yeah, great. Thanks. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to diving in. Uh, so we'll get started. This is a um, basically fresh news on SE and the trade is going to be an opening drive through the pre-market uh, low. I have level here, but it's, it's technically the low. Uh, and this was on August 15th. Um, so overall, the bigger picture, um, this was a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, that large gap and fail um, in late July. And after that huge red day, you can see on the chart there, uh, we had basically confirmed a, a short term downtrend. So the, that blue line is the nine EMA on the daily chart and the white line is the 21 EMA on the daily chart. And uh, it just gives me a good reference point, just glancing at the overall big picture as to where we are, where the momentum is, and who may be in control at, at the time of, uh, of the, the day I'm taking the trade. Is it okay if we say that big red candle potentially confirms that we're getting ready to reverse? I think so. I think that it's, it's a pretty clear um, signal. I just wanna, I wanna make the distinction between it's definitely a signal and we definitely have to reverse or pull in from potentially it's a signal confirming. I see. Those yeah, are two different things. Sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And the difference is if you see this as potentially being a signal of confirmation, when you're in it, you'll be open, more open-minded to you being wrong. If you aren't, you'll be less open-minded to being wrong and you may get too stubborn you may not cut off a trade you should quicker. You may take a loss that's bigger than is necessary. And uh, you may double down. You may, you may add risk 
that's unwarranted that causes a, a, a bigger loss than, than, than needs to be there. So these are signals that give us a better chance of being right, but not definitely. Right. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree with that. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's stacking the odds more in our favor, but th that doesn't mean that it's um, nothing in trading is absolute as everyone in this call knows. Uh, and then so the basically leading up to this trade, we had been in a range between about 450 and 443. Um, so that was over the past couple of days. And so that just, I was more likely to gravitate to in play names um, that will diverge from the market choppiness as we kind of pin between this, this range of 450 and 443.30. Good. You do a good job there of uh, pointing out the key levels that are important. I like how you do that with your technical analysis there. Thanks. Yeah. Just a, uh, another reference point. Uh, this is the SPY on a 30-minute chart. I don't want to spend too much time here. Um, this is a relatively long slideshow. So um, this uh, is just kind of giving another reference point. This is just a zoomed in view of it. And again, just kind of pinned between that 450, 451, and 443 level. So while we're in this range, um, going to gravitate to in-play names and not necessarily going to be looking for a ton of market wind behind my back in either direction until we have direction in the market. So these are the intraday fundamentals on SE. Uh, it reported earnings the morning of August 15th. Um, the EPS was a 21% miss, so uh, reported 54 cents versus 69 cents. Uh, the sales were down 10%, uh, so a 10% miss, uh, 3.1 billion versus 3.42 billion. And they there was a lack of guidance here, which prevented me from grading this as a negative eight or a negative nine catalyst. On deeper review, though, as I was going through it, uh, and I, I believe Jeff uh, brought it up in the 11 a.m. meeting uh, the day of this trade, he asked if uh, SE rel um, regularly released guidance, and the answer was not necessarily. And so I, I may have overweighted the lack of guidance in this name and not given enough credit to basically the overall setup that we had here that we'll get into in the technicals as well as the EPS and the revenue beat. Um, so on the right, I have the intraday fundamentals, um, ATR at 2.39, uh, AVOL at 8 million, 80% institutional ownership, which I thought was a check in favor. Uh, anything over 50% um, for me is, is relatively high. And so I thought that 80% um, was going to cause this stock to pick a direction and move cleanly if it did um, decide on a direction off of the open. Um, and then our vol was obviously extremely elevated. Uh, we'll go into the pre-market um, in a few slides, but the, the volume was pretty insane on SE in the pre-market as well as off open and uh, float and short float there. Well, it's a big miss, right? Yeah, a big miss. When you went back to look to see if SE gives guidance regularly, what did you find? When I pulled it back up, I saw that they hadn't released um, any sort of guidance since November of 2022. And before then, it had even been longer before that. Um, so it's not a tight. It basically gave me the context afterwards that this isn't a company that is willing to release guidance at every earnings report. And with that in mind, it I may have overweighted the fact that they didn't give guidance, I should not have been as concerned on that end. So looking back at it, what would you give this news catalyst? I think um, after looking that they didn't release guidance, I would give it at least a negative 8.5. Okay, so it's a news catalyst. Yeah, yeah, definitely puts it in play and um, definitely over the kind of standard which we we've graded negative seven. So the negative eight or negative 8.5, I think would be a good way to range this one. Let's just go back to the big picture and let you know how you're doing. So big picture, fine. I think you did a good job. I, I like when people point out the levels that are most significant for the overall market. And I think you did that well. I, I do like when people add what the biggest theme in the market is and highlight that. So we have better context, but in terms of grading your bigger picture, that's an 
if you go to intraday fundamentals, I think this is a pretty good catalyst. You do a good job covering all the names. I think that's an 8.5 for your inf in, uh, intraday fundamentals. Let's go to the trade strategy. This tra trade criteria, um, the setup is uh, the fresh news gap continuation. Um, so for those, I basically just have uh, the trade criteria for me when I do these playbooks, it's always based on, uh, not always, but for the most part, it's based on criteria I have in a scanner, and we'll get into that technology in the next slide. But all that I'm basically looking for is market cap above 500 million, uh, price above $20, uh, the gap of plus or minus 3%, and holding the gap near the open, elevated RVOL, uh, minimum 400,000 in the pre market, and uh, confirmation intraday uh, using my intraday playbook um, for the actual trade that we'll get into um, so that kind of sets up the the picture for me that that gets me halfway there and at least you know gets me near the right names to be in the actual trade um, I basically use three separate trades on for your trade times. criteria setup do you need a news catalyst yes yeah sorry that's not in there but yeah for the for the fresh news gap continuation it also includes an um, a seven or above news catalyst. All right, so let's add that to the trade criteria setup. Yeah. Okay. Entry criteria trade. Yeah, so I basically will only use um, three. This is something that you learn from Jeff by listening to his 11 o'clock meetings? Yes, yeah, over, over a couple of months, I kind of, um, he had brought up the concept a few times and um, we didn't necessarily dive too deep into it but a couple of months ago after hearing the concept being brought up and um, really looking at my own playbook and the way that I was trading at the time I thought that the setting it up and structuring it this way just made the most sense to me and and so now I basically have each of my each of my trades um, systematized in, in this catalyst setup trade format yeah so for this um, setup the uh, gap uh, fresh news gap continuation. I will really only use three entry criteria. Um, one of them is the back through open, um, the gap give and go, which you and Carter did a playbook on a, a few months ago, um, and then the opening drive, which is is the one that I use here. And I won't read everything word for word there, but basically on the opening drive, I, I really prefer it to be through a pre market high or low. Um, or I put pre-market level just because sometimes there's confluence of, of level and it, not, it may not quite be the pre-market low, but I really prefer pre-market low or pre-market high. Um, after For the opening drive, after the initial break of that level, I like to see, and I just call it seesaw. I know that um, other people might call it something different. How important of a pre-market level do you need? How are you defining pre-market level? Yeah, so the pre-market level has to be if I'm grading it, it needs to be at least a seven or eight out of 10. And that's a little vague. Um, but if I had to put an absolute number on it, I would say if it's a seven out of 10, I'll, I'll, I will be looking at it for an opening drive. Yeah, for pre-market, you're gonna need a higher score on that. I don't okay. think you're gonna take anything less than 8.5. Okay. And you're going to want to be really clear about how you define a pre-market level. So you're going to want to see elevated volume in the pre-market. You might define that as a percentage of the overall daily volume mm -hmm. done. So you might, you might want to say, I need to see a percentage, and you can choose that percentage. I need to see 30% in the pre-market done of the average daily volume. Mm -hmm for it to even constitute a potential pre-market level. And then pre-market level is defined by can't get above an inflection point at least three times, um, or is in a consolidation pattern for at least 45 minutes and that consolidation pattern isn't greater than 50 cents. You, you need to define that. Right. Specifically, does that make sense? Yeah, that, that does make sense, yes. Okay, and I, I'm just throwing out some examples. There's a lot more of them, but immediately that's how I'm thinking through defining pre-market level as a, as a, at a minimum. Right, yeah, and how to trade off of that. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's why I gravitate more towards um, just pre-market low or pre-market high because it, it's pretty straightforward. It's either the pre-market high or low, but I think that adding on top of 
uh, what you just said there and adding that criteria also to the pre-market higher low level. If you're specific in how you define pre-market level, you will put yourself in a position to make money. If you're not, you'll put yourself in a position to have inconsistent results. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes total sense to me. Yeah. So defining that pre-market level. And then after we get a break, a break of that level, um, that's where I'm zoning in on the tape. I like to see a specific action on the tape uh, to confirm uh, putting risk on and um, having tight risk on that specific trade. And then with the confirmation, I will I will get full size uh, risking either above the open price or high of day at the time. Um, some of the reasons to cover, unusual held bid at low of day, um, an unusual hold above VWAP, and then uh, in the best case, extensions through low of day. And after we get those extensions, just using a two minute bar trailing stop. All right, great. And so I want to give you some feedback. I think your stock selection is really solid. I think this is a active trading stock. I think this is a good day trading stock to select. I think that's an eight and a half. Pretty solid stock selection. And in looking back at some of the better opportunities of the month, I do think this was one of the better opportunities. So I think solid job there. On the trade strategy part, we, we've got to do better. You have to be more specific, uh, not specific enough. And, and the reason I say that is because the way that you are uh, presenting this here is not going to lead to you making money. Right. And so I, I want to be, I want to really challenge you here on this because if you don't improve, you're, you're, you, a lot of this is really solid. It's just not specific enough. Yeah. And, you know, for a independent trader, this is terrific. For a professional proprietary trader, it's not up to the standards we see on the desk. So this, is, this I would grade as a six in terms of your trade strategy because you want to be more specific. All right, but, but good so far. Let's go on to technology. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot of the scanners and, and the basic spreadsheet I use. Uh, so the scanner all the way to the left is uh, basically just spitting out names each morning with the criteria I went over in the trade setup. Uh, so that just gets me a list that I can flip through and start to kind of narrow in each morning. Uh, the, the spreadsheet in the middle is just, a, it's very simple. Um, it's just where I put the earnings numbers in and it crunches the percentages and guidance and everything for me. Uh, so I don't have to spend a ton of time um, you know, doing manual calculations each morning or anything. And then on the right is uh, just a snapshot of, of my news source. So I basically work from left to right. I'll get the name off of my scanner. I'll do some of the um, numbers on the spreadsheet and then uh, check out the, um, the news source to obviously get those numbers and to read for guidance and things like that. So super simple, but um, that's how I like to keep it simple. Yeah, good. 8.5 out of 10 on that. I don't know what your criteria is necessarily for those scanners. I would imagine the more specific you get with there, the better, the more helpful that's going to be. But that, that's that's a good. This is a good start. Eight and a half. Moving on. Yep. yep. Um, so we can kind of flip through these, but these are just some other quick examples of um, relatively the same setup and the same trade. So this was UPST a few days before. Um, here was SEDG at the beginning of the month. So same criteria from the same scanner, um, basically the same intraday setup. So just kind of um, adding a few examples there to give some context. That's really good. That's a, oh. that's a really good job of you adding other instances like that. That's, that is classic Paul Tudor Jones trading, right? Where let's go find instances like the one we're getting ready to trade and what happened. So there's, there's a, a great video that gets erased from the internet of Paul Trudeau Jones doing this very thing. And uh, I don't know if he erases it or somebody erases it for him, but it, it's up for a little bit of time and then people watch it and then it goes away. And maybe it's up now permanently, but it used to go up and disappear. But that, that was a classic best practice that, that he utilized to... To, to trade, and obviously he's you know one of the greatest traders ever in U.S. market history. Mm -hmm. So so great best practice there. Well done. Here's the bigger picture on SE. Um, pretty clear level there at 5440. Um, 
if I had to grade it, I would give it at least an eight and a half. We didn't necessarily touch that exact price multiple times, but you can see a few of those dips um, caught bids just above. Uh, but now we're below that key 5450 le or excuse me 5550 level, um, and and basically all of the volume and all of the trading that has been done over the past uh, year. So clearly gapping out of range. Um, clear check in favor. Here's the weekly chart. Um, not so good. Kind of a a red flag on the weekly chart uh, from 370 uh, to 40 dollars. So one of those names that has just been beaten up and can't catch a break, it seems like. Your last okay. two slides, I would label them technical analysis and not bigger picture. Okay. When you're thinking about a trade, you want to have longer term technicals. And that's what that chart is. And that's what the chart before is. You actually do a really good job of showing super important levels. I actually think that is at least an eight, maybe an eight and a half. Yes. If you flip to the to the next slide again, I think this is uh, th these are significant levels that are showing on our longer term charts. All right, so that's longer term technical analysis, longer term technical analysis, and then intraday technical analysis is the next slide. Yeah, just want you thinking through it that way. And the reason I want you to think it through that way is because you can make a trade based off of a technical analysis catalyst. Right. You don't always need a news catalyst. So I want you labeling these and thinking through these the right way. Bigger picture right. is bigger picture is for the bigger market. What are the important levels, SPIs, Qs, IWM? What is driving the market in this present market regime? That's the big picture. So the first major check in favor here on the day of the trade is um, we're holding the gap. And, and I just define holding the gap Pretty simple. Um, we're holding 50% of, of the gap and we have all of the checks in favor as far as volume goes. So there at the bottom you can see um, we had traded about 4.8 million shares and um, we're gapping more than 20%. So we were had the gap check in favor. We were holding that gap. It, it wasn't choppy price action. It was um, relatively clean price action uh, in the pre-market and we had a clear um, downtrend forming in the pre-market that 45.10 um, is right about where we open um, and that 45 is kind of the confluence level from the pre-market uh, as we come into 8 or come into 930. So I just included this um, this slide to uh, account for the amount of pre-market volume we were doing. This is can certainly be a trade that I look to incorporate into this type of setup um, in my playbook with the pre-market volume with the clear level um, here at 4650. Uh, once we get below that and start to hold below that in the pre-market, I think that is a um, it's an it's a good spot to at least start into your position. I know that Caleb had a really good entry here under 4650, and we talked through that a bit um, after after we traded this um, that day. But I think that incorporating this type of entry allows me to start to take advantage of of the bigger picture move earlier. And that 4650 level is below support on our daily chart and below support on our weekly chart? Yes. All right, I think that's significant too, right? Right, yeah, correct. Yeah, and, and with the amount of volume. We have daily chart, we have longer term technical analysis weakness, broken, broken to the downside, right? Right. Fair? Yes, yeah, fair. We have intraday weakness broken below 4650, fair? Agreed. So we have a confluence of a longer term technical breakdown and an intraday technical breakdown, which happens to be being expressed pre-market. Fair? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Powerful technical signal, right? I, I agree. OK. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. With a negative news catalyst. With a negative news catalyst on top of it. Yeah. Everything was. Uh, You're trading a weak stock. You I yeah. mean, you want to trade strong stocks and be long. You want to trade very. You want to trade unusually strong stocks and be long. You want to trade unusually weak stocks and be short. For good stock selection and good active day trading, should go down until somebody steps in to buy this thing. It could take that could take a long time. Uh, so this is the open. Um, this is a NYSE uh, ticker. So this looks like a pretty 
picture perfect up through open, um, but technically speaking, we didn't open until um, 9.32, and my chart will say 8.30. I'm central time, so that's the difference there. But um, So I treated this as a, a, as a opening drive. Where are you located? I'm in Louisiana, central time, yeah. Okay. So we get the drive through the pre-market uh, 45 level, and, and you'll see this on the tape. It's it's not as clear here on the chart, but uh, we do see that seesaw action on the tape, and that's where I start getting short um, and, and where the shot clock kind of turns on. You do not have a southern accent. Really? I That's that's surprising because I, I didn't think it. I did. I mean, do, you, do you have it and I just don't hear it? No, I don't think I have it either, but it's it's interesting because I lived in Chicago for a bit, um, and uh, right out of college, I lived in Chicago, and like the first three people I talked to in Chicago were like, oh yeah, you're, you're definitely from somewhere down there, and I was like, really? I, I feel like I don't have... So it's, it's refreshing to know. Thank you for the... Uh, for I the... would have thought you were actually... <laughs> I, I, I thought you were from the Midwest. Um, wow. Yeah. Well, good to know. Or I have, or I have terrible judgment in, in speaking voices, either one. I grew up in Long Island, and when I, I went to school in New England, and when I was in college, people would make fun of me for having a Long Island accent. And after <laughs> having spent a bunch of time in New England, I don't think I actually have an accent anymore. Maybe other people pick it up, but I, I lost it uh, living there. So yeah, maybe you lost yours. Maybe I grew out of it. Yeah, you're right. Maybe it... Uh... Maybe it just changed. Yeah, I don't know. That's it's funny though. I uh, it's so funny that you say that because some people think I do, some people I think I don't. So there we go. I Same don't hear it. You there. sound like you're from the Midwest to me. But so for the for the drive, uh, we get this uh, seesaw action, which we'll watch on the tape. Um, I hit short, uh, risking forty five sixty, uh, which was the high of not technically the open, but the high of that first green bar. Um, so I'm I'm giving it a little room to spray on me. Um, so I'm hitting short at 45, uh, right at just above 45, and giving it to 45.60. Now our level is 46.50. We're hitting it at 45.60. What do we think about that? Yeah. So the 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 trade is being put on at 45, and the the actual trade is being risked up to 45.60. Okay. Um, got it. Thank th you. That that's the drive. Yeah. Um, so the next slide here is. I just uh, I we, never like so I, I always think uh, your stop should never be a whole number. Okay. Should always be like sixty-one cents, or fifty-six cents, or fifty-one cents. The reason for that is that extra penny is worth it. You'll be right a little bit more, and uh, in in the end, that tends to 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 make you a little bit more money. Stocks uh, tend to be less likely to touch sixty-one than they do to stop at sixty. Very insider baseball, very advanced uh, entry exit note there. So just something for you to think about. Unless, of course, there was just an unusual hold, unusual resistance at 59 cents, at 45, 59, then you would cover at 60 cents. All right, so, so get in the habit of setting those stops, giving yourself a little bit of one extra penny. So the trade's on. Um... We start. We get that move down. It's starting to work. Uh, we try to bid back above 44.80 um, in that right at the beginning of that second minute candle, and, and we'll see that on the tape. Um, and then after trying to rebid 44.80, you can kind of see that little wick there. Uh, we flush 44.60. This would be. I, I didn't take this ad. This is just hindsight and and looking back on the trade. Um, but this would be a great spot to add if I wasn't able to get full risk right on that 45 um, for the drive that would be confirmation um, to add to this position. If I were to add here, the risk would be cutting half above um, that 45.60 or, excuse me, half of back above the open price, um, which was 45.10. So half would come off at 45.11 and then the entire position would be cut at 45.60 in this case, if I were to add here. But like I said, I, I didn't execute on this, just thought it was an important spot. I really like how you're specifically showing where you would add. So one of the things I say all the time to our traders, and not all the time, one of the things I say often to our traders when I read their daily report cards and give them feedback is very good trade. Where specifically could you have added? They'll say something like, made a good trade, I could have been bigger. I'll say, not good enough. Where specifically 
could you have added what would have been the stop for that ad what would have been the target for that ad and getting into the habit of being very specific about how you could have traded it better so i like how you added where you could have gotten bigger um, even better to say i would have been i would have cut it here i would have covered it here make sense makes sense yes yeah that's a super important thing to do you, you gotta challenge yourself when you do well in trades this is a money-making trade you gotta really challenge yourself push yourself to have made more and that's how you, and that's how you think about doing that where would i have added how much how much risk and be specific about it okay moving on so these are where the first covers come in. Um, I'm taking off around one third of my position between 43.50 and 43.25. So it's it's technically two covers. Um, Let's but go, it, chop. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? That 43.50 and 43.25 are two executions, but it's about a third of my position um, as we begin to see a little bit of a change on the tape. Um, that, that big green bar is an obvious change, um, but I, I front ran that a little bit when we held bids at 43.75 um, and was basically just getting out um, initially into that weakness. The, rain, the, the rest of my position um, is going to be taken off uh, after we get a new low of day extension and then using a two minute bar trailing stop. Um, or, or of course, uh, like we talked about earlier, an unusual held bid at low of day. So um, either of those two will get me out of the rest of this uh, so this is now a two-minute chart. Um, that's why it's going to look a little bit different. But this is um, about half an hour or, yeah, about half an hour, about 35, 40 minutes after those initial covers. We get that next leg down, which is great. It's working. And um, now I'm taking out another third um, at 42.19, which is using the two-minute bar trail um, after we break through low of day. So we get the break. And then after I see that break, I'm basically just putting a two-minute bar trail. So out of another one third, just above $42. We, we get back to 42.90 and put in a lower high and begin trading back to low of day. Uh, this is another one of those spots where I don't have the executions on the chart, but this is a, another spot that I'm beginning to work on building out in these types of trades. Uh, this is a good spot to add, um, adding on that first retracement um, back towards VWAP. Preferably, I'd like to see it get higher um, which is kind of the fine line I'm walking right now where I don't know qu quite how high is high enough and how low is too low. And so that's kind of a project I've started on my own um, in these kind of layup day one trades. Um, so this is kind of showing that. And then this is also where um, I'm taking off the rest of my position. So um, right at that 42 low, well, we have that pop. We come back into low of day um, and we immediately rebid it. This is a two minute chart, but it happened within one minute. Um, where we broke through that low of day and very quickly um, bids popped right back above, volume started to come in, um, the tape sped up, and I viewed it as a change in character. Um, so I was flat um, at 41.50 right under that 42 candle. So good, good covers. So flat at 41.50 right under that 42 on the read. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, your trade management is really solid. I'm, I'm going to call that an 8.5 out of 10. Think about your stops as we discussed, and I would have loved for you to have added to the position, but really, but, but really solid. All right, moving on. Won't spend too much time here. I think the only really important part is um, talking about that quote unquote seesaw move. Um, and J Jeff and I talked about this a few weeks ago in, in one of my other playbooks I did with him, um, or actually it was in a reading the tape that we did together on my NVIDIA trade, where it's a, uh, we'll, we'll watch it and, and I'll try and explain it that way. So this is the open and here come, this is the seesaw. So there's the first one where we try on the tape, we try and pop, pop back up to 45 and we get smacked. Then we do it again and we get smacked and again, and we start creeping up and it, it kind of, it's almost a decrement and then it, and then it, the bids flush there and we start trading below 44.80. And so that's where I'm hitting at like 44.90 ish. Um, after that seesaw action, and this is where the shot clock turns on for me. So if I'm taking an opening drive at a 8 out of 10 level uh, pre-market low, which we talked about, and there's volume coming in, um, after I see that kind of 
it pops up and can't go much higher, it pops up, can't go higher, pops up, can't go higher, and then the bids drop, that's where I want to be involved, and that's where the shot clock turns on. Um, so if this, for example, would have kind of stalled out at 44, 80, 45 and started to curl, I would have, uh, I don't think I necessarily would have cut the entire position. I would give that to 4560 or 4561. Um, but I would certainly, it would be a trade decision whether or not I wanted to um, size down or take some risk off because it's not quite the momentum opening drive I was expecting. Um, so the shot clock is on here. And that will come into play because it kind of looks like we're going to go there and then we don't. And so we start to seesaw again, and I zoom out a little here just to make sure I'm not crazy, and this trade is, is where I want to be. And then we get that flush back below um, 45. So now I feel pretty confident um, that I can put my risk at 45.60, and I know that I'm wrong. Um, basically, if we start to hold open price and, and get above 60, I know I'm wrong. And you'll see it kind of it, it, it'll seesaw around here uh, before we finally go. And the bids drop 60 once again. And then we skip and we're down to the 40s. And so um, that's really the only, I mean, I can fast forward a bit here, but we get that nice move down, the first cover's there, but that's really all I, I think that was. If, if you want to see more, uh, Mike, we can go through more, but I think that's the only really. All right, great. And I think that's that's a good example. Thanks for sharing that. For purposes of the playbook, that's 8.5 out of 10 in terms of illustrating reading the tape for us. Moving on. Uh, the main thing I did well, and this is something that has been my main focus for um, the past two months, has just uh, being sure that I'm giving myself every chance possible to be in the easy money, um, quote unquote, easy money and uh, the layup trades. So this this really was a layup trade, um, not a very complex strategy, not complex price action. It was a weak stop, uh, a weak stock with weak earnings and I got in on a weak momentum play. And so it was, it was a layup and I think I did a good job of improving that end of my playbook where I'm no longer um, searching for plays each morning, I'm filtering and letting them come to me. Um, other than missing the pre-market entry, uh, which we talked about, I think that my executions were um, not ideal, um, but they were better, and I'm getting much cleaner executions on these day one plays. Um, really quick, what I need to improve uh, with some solutions, I need to be able to incorporate that pre-market, uh, basically hold below 46.50. That's a very clear area that can um, be a good place to start into my position and then take that opening drive as the momentum play um, with that sort of backstop of an average below 46.50. Um, the initial pop to VWAP, which we talked about, that first bounce is a good place to add and uh, risk um, either that lower high or, or a hold above VWAP, and so should have been adding there. So going forward, I've started to, as the move starts to work in my favor, I will immediately start setting alerts on the way back up uh, and the levels that we're going. Yeah, good. The and uh, I think you do a good job here of pointing out what you did well. I think you do a good job of putting the solutions in right here. This is a nine out of 10 for your trade review. And that's it. All right, let's add it up here. Kurt, stock selection, 8.5. Big picture, 8.5. Trade strategy, six. Kurt will probably have a little booing action to me thrown into this into this video. So you can probably hear the boos right there. Uh, intraday fundamentals, 8.5. Technical analysis, 9 out of 10. I don't think I had given you a grade on that yet. Reading the tape, 8.5. Trade management, 8.5. Technology, 8.5. Review, 9. Diligence, which we haven't given you a grade on yet, 9.5. Kurt, you're going to have to tally that up and give us his score. Did he break 80? 84.5. All right. Pretty good. It's a good start. Pretty good. Not bad. All right, Grant. Well, now I know why I've been hearing good things about you. Pretty solid review. Appreciate you, uh, you joining us here. And uh, we look forward to talking to you soon. So you're an active trader, not doing as well as you want. 
not doing as well as you deserve and you just can't figure out why you can't become profitable no matter how hard you try. Well, let me show you why. This is your competition. The traders in this room. This room right here is full of elite traders, some of whom are making seven and even eight figures a year. In fact, our top guys have made nearly 20 million each in net trading profits in a single year. Let's head to my office so I can share more. So you're probably used to seeing videos of lavish trader lifestyles, trading gurus, trading off of the laptop for an hour a day, heck, maybe even 15 minutes a day, and then them relaxing on some secluded beach for the rest of the day. Well, all I can tell you is that our traders train like pro athletes. They live and breathe the markets and are continually working on their trading skills. Because at our firm, that's what we found it really takes to make it in this game. I'm Mike Bellafieri, co-founder and managing partner of SMB Capital, one of the world's top proprietary trading firms located in Midtown Manhattan. And we're always looking for trading talent to hire and develop. And not just to trade in-house on our desk, but also to trade from their own home, entirely using our firm's capital. And we have numerous traders doing just that allowing them to make upwards of seven figures trading the firm's capital without risking their own money. But to even get a shot at something like that, you need to have the right training. That's why we're doing a new free online presentation in which we share how you can get an interview with SMB to become an in-house or remote trader, trading firm capital without risking yours and getting access to all of our firm's coaching and resources. And the best part? You don't have to be a profitable trader yet. In fact, we prefer to mold profitable traders with our methods and our techniques. That's why we have just three simple criteria that can earn anyone an interview. We're looking for highly ambitious and determined traders who fit our culture first and foremost. So if you believe that could be you, sign up for the free one hour online presentation by clicking the link that's in your top right corner of your screen now.